John's Gospel, chapter 17. And just keep your Bible open there, five o'clock this morning. My voice started to give me trouble, and I, don't, I didn't have trouble with it for maybe six or eight months. But you'll have to put up with me because the Lord has given me a message, and I need to preach it, and you need to hear it. So the Lord will, I believe, help me. Just focus, keep your Bible open, and keep it open. We'll be turning to no other scriptures other than John 17. Last Thursday morning, around noon, the whole world's media was locked and gazed upon what has to be the most famous door in the world, number 10 Downing Street. Punters and reporters and spectators and photographers, armed police, and even Larry the Cat were all looking at us from that door. Everybody waited with bated breath for a reaction and a response for one man and a few of the faithful followers that he had left. One reporter said that it the nation hung in the balance. Another said that uh, this was Britain's crisis hour. 2,022 years ago, a similar scene was addressed outside a less famous door, the door of the upper room in the city of Jerusalem. And as the night clouds were gathering over the city on that evening, out came the Lord Jesus Christ, followed by, followed by 11 of his faithful cabinet followers. The 11 disciples. Judas had already gone. What a scene that must have been inside. He just washed the disciples' feet. He celebrated the Last Supper. They sang a hymn and they prayed, and he said, let us go hence. And silhouetted by the full Passover moon, they made their way down the stone steps on the outside of the upper room and across the eastern gate and down over the brook Kidron, known as the Dark Waters, and up into Gethsemane. This was the Lord Jesus Christ's final night on earth. In less than 12 hours, indeed a number less than 12 hours, the good shepherd of the sheep would be smitten and the flock would be scattered. Judas was about to betray him. Peter would soon deny him. The disciples would soon forsake him. Soldiers would spit on him, strip him, scourge him. And the ferocious bulls of Bashan would open their mouth to strip their teeth to devour him. He goes down into the deep where there's no standing, and he himself said, I have poured out like waters and all my bones are out of joint. And worst of all, devastating of all and more painful of all, his heavenly father was going to abandon him in the greatest hour of need. Now how do we find this man in this crisis hour? How do we find the Lord Jesus Christ on the eve of death, Gethsemane, Gabbatha, Golgotha, and every evil thing that can be... How do we find him? Well, we need to gaze on verse 1 of chapter 17. You see, chapter 14, 15, and 16, he preached his sermon to them in and out of the upper room as they made their way. Now, when we come to chapter 17... In the last verse of 33 of 16, 
He says, the last word he says to them, in the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So how do we find him here now in this transition, just as he is going up into Gethsemane, just as he's going across the dark waters of the Kidron and he's going to face something men never faced and never will? How do we find him? Hiding, duking, whimpering? No, we find him praying. We find him praying. Look at verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes towards heaven and said, Father, Father, Father. He didn't say mother. As one of our established churches in the land, and I'll not name them, but I should. I was talking to one who was in a meeting and left it. When they were handed sheets for a prayer meeting that they were going to have, and they were told that they'd have to address, and I'm talking about that. I'm not naming the church, but I should. When we pray today, we're going to have to address him as mother and father together. Shame on them. He says, Father, not Mary, not Muhammad, not Buddha, not a crockery of stones or a piece of wood, not the silver shine of, of the Diana of Ephesus or the unknown God of Athens. Father, no chanting to idols, no bowing and scraping. He turned his head up, he looked up towards heaven, and he said, Father, friend, where else can we go in the crisis hour? Where else can they go gathered around that intensive care ward and that child of 21 years of age? Where can we go? We're not as smart then. We're not as clever then. There's no dirty jokes then. When you have your child in intensive care, and wired up and told that uh, you may have to make a decision. We're not as smart then. And don't wait till you're there before you start to pray. Father, now I know that some this morning re resent maybe the word Father. And it is known this morning, and there are many this morning whose fathers have abused them and embarrassed them. But to us, to me this morning, and to you this morning, the children of God this morning, we have a loving Heavenly Father. Never make any mistake about that. In verse 1, he calls him Father. And if you read it right, in verse 1, he calls him Heavenly Father. In verse 11, he calls him Holy Father. Verse 25, he calls him Righteous Father. And he would know. He was with him for all eternity. And in Luke, he calls him, in, in Luke, he's called Our Father. You know, for 25 years, I served another father. And many of you this morning served the father of the devil for many, many years. He done nothing but done me harm. He lied to me. He shamed me. He abused me. He abandoned me. He tried to kill me many times. Do you realize that this morning, that you that have been plucked as brands from the burning, that this was the case with you? If the devil would have got his way, he stole a farm of land from me from the shore of Loch Erne that a couple of years ago was worth millions. He robbed me from my home and from my livelihood. He put me out of the streets of Manchester as a beggar into the slums and hovels and hell holes of this world. But praise God this morning, loved with everlasting love, led by grace that love to know. I thank God for a loving, heavenly, caring Father. I thank God for the day that, he, that I lifted my lustful, sinful, wicked eyes onto heaven. And with my voice, I said, God, God, if you're there, 
Will you do something with this life of mine? And like the prodigal lad day in Fermanagh, I resolved to rise and go to my father. I resolved to leave the swine, the swine trucks and the hell holes and the card schools and the old life and go to my loving heavenly father who have found a faithful friend for 52 years. And like the old martyr of the first century when he said, Eighty and six years have I served him. And when they were putting him to death, they wanted him to curse him. He says, Eighty and six years I have served him, but he has done me no harm. I found that he never lied to me. I found that my father never failed me, never disappointed me, he never embarrassed me, he never robbed me. Instead, he gave me abundant life. He gave me joy, he gave me peace, he gave me love. He gave me the best wife that any man could get. He gave me a job. He gave me money. He gave me cars. He gave me gifts. He gave me calling. Oh, I was broken the other day when I read that verse in Jeremiah and the potter. He made it again. He made it again. Oh, my friends, listen, he can make us again. I love that wee phrase, he made it again. Some of you need a touch of the potter's hand this morning. Some of you need a touch. Oh, poor, wretched, miserable sinner this morning, not saved. Flee from one father to another now. He'll do you nothing but harm. He'll destroy you. Flee from one home to another. Flee from one kingdom to another. Flee from one life to another. Do what the prodigal did. He said, I will arise. Do what Jesus said. I will arise and go to my father. Not only is there a prayer here in verse 1. Watch it again. There's a place here. He lifted up his eyes towards heaven. Now, if I had no other scripture this morning about heaven, this would do me. What the Lord would say that cannot lie, it would do me. I have hundreds of scriptures about heaven. You don't think that at this solemn hour or any other hour, the Lord Jesus Christ would be play acting? You don't think that he's chanting and nodding? There was a fellow come into church one day some years ago and he had a wee fellow with him, two or three, and the father came in to sit down and the father bowed the head and the wee fellow said, him, what did you say? He said, shut up, be quiet in church. He didn't know what he said. If you believe in heaven, you believe in it with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. If there's nowhere else to tell me that heaven is a place, this is a place. Jesus Christ is not play acting at this hour or any other hour. If he says there's a heaven, there's a heaven for he was in it for all eternity and he's going back to it and that's where his father is and that's where he is this morning. Hallelujah. That's where he is this morning. And if Jesus says there's a heaven and his father's in it and if he says it's up there, then it's up there. And if he says hell is down, it's down there. And it is down there according to the scriptures. And it's a burning eternal flame of fire where you'll be if you're not saved. If Jesus says, Father, he's in heaven. If he says heaven is up there, then I believe that it's up there. Doesn't matter what Voltaire says. Doesn't matter what Karl Marx says or Einstein says or Dawkins, or Hawkins, or Gawkins, or anybody else, or the Bishop of Armagh. It doesn't matter what they hear. There's a heavenly Father in heaven. As I go, we started off this message of those three, of those messages of those three chapters, right up to the end of 16. He started them, of I go to prepare a place for you. And I thank God there's a place prepared in heaven. Lift up your eyes, believer, this morning towards heaven. And praise God that we have a Father in heaven and we have a home in heaven. It's a city, it's a country, it's a place where we shall be for all eternity with our loved ones, knowing our loved ones throughout eternity. How would you ever, my friend, sinner this morning, bargain with God for heaven and hell? 
Yeah, I wouldn't live another minute if I wasn't saved in this old wicked world. He lifted up his eyes towards heaven. Well, we know you should lift them towards the house of commons. There'll be no use in lifting them to the house of Lords or the house of Windsor or the house of Leinster or Stormont. And there'll be no use in lifting them even to God's house. Do you know at the end of his ministry, the Lord didn't call the house of God. He didn't call it the house of God. He didn't call it my house. He called it your house. You ever notice that? He wouldn't even call the people of God his people. And I'm afraid he's not far from that today in many places. Your house. We have took it over. We have tried to manipulate it. We have tried to run it. We need to get it back into his house. Back into his house. Yes, he lifted up his eyes towards heaven. In Luke 24, he lifted up his hands towards heaven. In praise. You know, one prayer meeting some time ago, I was in a prayer meeting here, and there was a good number in, and the presence of the Lord was real, as it was on Monday night and Wednesday night, by the way. And I noticed that there was three people with their hands up, and they were all converted Catholics. Praising God. Some of you old Presbyterians and Baptists or wherever you are, you've got a bit of praise in you. God help you. Can't even get to a prayer meeting anyway. Don't be afraid to lift your hands. He lifted his hands in praise. He lifted his hands in prayer. He lifted his head in prayer. Don't mumble away down in behind the seat. Open up your mouth and stand up. Father, he's worth talking to, let me tell you. He's there. He's listening. Don't be mumbling out a few words. Just praise him. Don't be restricted to praise him. Oh, but they say I'm Pentecost. Well, that's a good name anyway. It's a scriptural name. There was a man saying to me, a pastor of a certain church said to me one day, in our church, you know, one day there was a man put up his hand. I was going to ask him, did he want to go to the toilet? God help us. Don't you be restricted in praising the Lord. If, if a sin, it'll have to come out, you know. If you're bubbling over with joy and sins forgiven and peace with God and assurance, my friend, you'll want to, you'll want to, you'll want to express it. You'll not care who's sitting beside you. And these dear Catholics saved from the darkness of Rome, not allowed to touch the morsel of bread and not allowed to do anything. Only rules and regulations and tradition, my friend, is great to be free. And he that the Son sets free is free indeed. He lifted up his eyes towards heaven here. He lifted up his hands and praise in verse 24. I could go on in the things that our Lord lifted up, but he lifted up himself in John 12. He says, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me, signifying the death that he would die. The cross. Friend, listen, the cross draws this morning. The cross saves this morning. The cross cleanses this morning. The cross forgives this morning. And it was the cross of Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed on Calvary that lifted me. He lifted me. He lifted you this morning and saved. From sinking sands, he lifted me. With tender hands, he lifted me. Praise him this morning that he has lifted you out of the pit of the miry clay. Part of the farm of the land my father had down in Fermanagh, it was, it was Blue Till. One shower rain that lay on top of it. And there was an old gap, there was old gaps in it, and boy, I tell you, if you got your Wellingtons down into it, and I, I, have, I have had occasions when I had to take me, I couldn't get my Wellingtons to pull them out of my feet. And I was strong enough. I have to take the Wellingtons off and hold on to the top of them and get over onto a bit of hard ground to try to get them pulled out. Oh, tell you. That was queer stuff. You used, used to take it and seal pipes and all with it. It was like cement. Old, old blue till. 
Boy, I'll tell you, that's where we were. We were bogged down in the mire, bogged down in sin and shame and all sorts of filth and dirt and everything's gone and it's free and it should be free. And you should be cleansed this morning and you should be rejoicing this morning. And if you claim to be a child of God, my friend, your shackles should be gone and you should praise him. Yes, out of the miry clay, set my feet upon the rock, put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto a God that many would see it. You have to see it. I don't see it. I'm sad. I don't see it in a lot of God's people. I don't see it. Don't see it. Boy, we need to see it. Why is it that we do? others don't see it? If we have this eternal life, if we have Christ abiding in us, if we have him living in us, we should be able to see it. So there's a prayer in the text. There's a place in the text. There's a period in the text. Do you notice what it says again? Verse 1, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Do you know how long it took for this hour to come here? 4,000 years. Some, some of you think you're waiting now. Look at verse 4 of, the, of Revelation of John 17. I have glorified thee in the earth. I have finished the work that thou hast given me to do. He hasn't been to, to, to the cross yet, but it's as good as finished. He didn't cry finished yet now. He doesn't cry finished to the next day on the cross, <clears throat> but it's as good as finished. See, when the Lord says he's going to do something, he'll do something. And you can take his word that he'll finish it, and he did. Finished. Well, that takes me way back to the first promise ever made in Genesis chapter 3. And God said to the serpent, the devil, Thou shalt bruise his heel, but thou shalt bruise his head. This prophecy is now going to be fulfilled at the place called Calvary after 4,000 years, one of thousands. Psalm 22, Psalm 69, Isaiah 53, they're all going to be fulfilled now. This is the hour. Six times he could say, my hour is not yet come. And maybe you're praying for something this morning and you're battling over some things this morning and you're wondering why things are not happening. It could well be that your hour has not yet come. It will come. It will come. Make no mistakes about it. It will come. And if you're holding on to promises of God, you just hold on to them tight this morning, for they will come to pass. But it will be in his time. When we were up around the bed of Salissa the other night, I realized that even the anointing of oil with that wee child, with, with that young girl, and even the prayers, and many prayers are going up. But we cannot hasten it. No, we cannot hinder it. The sovereign will of God. And we need always to remember when we're praying in these circumstances that there's a sovereign God working above all that we don't know. We can love our children and we can cherish our children. We can have nights of prayer and fasting. And so we should and so we must. And Jesus is praying here. And if he needed to pray, we would need to pray. But at the end of the day, there's a sovereign. There's an eternal God. Old Jimmy Armstrong, the Baptist pastor in Armagh, who I was a deacon under for a number of years, he was a powerful man on the sovereignty of God. Fourteen policemen served in Arm, went to Armagh Baptist Church. Fourteen policemen attended the church, many of them members, that served round South Armagh in the worst years of the trouble, never lost one. 
And he used to quote to us this scripture, death and plagues around me fly. Till he bids, I cannot die. Not a single shaft can hit until the God of love sees fit. You get that into your mind this morning. He's in control as we're going to see as we come to a close. You see, there's a prayer here and there's a place here and there's a period here. And let me say there's a period when you shall die and when I shall die and nothing will hinder it if it's the Lord's will. It is appointed on the man once to die. Sinner, it could be tonight for you and you're not saved. Imagine going out from a meeting or going out from a gospel meeting. Imagine going out from a home where you've been told and you know from a child and you end up in the flames of hell and it's too late. There's a place and there's a prayer and there's a period and there's a purpose. Glorify thy son that he might glorify, that he might glorify thee. We're not going to deal with that this morning because if I do, I'll miss what I want to close with. But let me say this. What he's praying here is, Lord, you get the glory. You get the glory in Gethsemane, Gebatha, when they're slaying me, and when they're stripping me, and when they're spitting in my face. You get the glory, Lord. You get the glory, Lord, when they're nailing me onto the cross. I want you to get the glory. You'll glorify me, and I'll glorify you, and I'll glorify you how through suffering and through the cross and through pain and through shame. That's the way sometimes we have to glorify God, you know. I think that Deborah's glorified. Lord, how do we stand in the crisis hour? The Lord just didn't run and turn his eyes up for the Father when he was in the crisis. He didn't just turn his eyes on the Lord, Gethsemane, and Gebatham. He prayed two prayers on this day. You know, this was one of them, and the other was in his belly in Gethsemane's garden. You could pray a prayer in the morning and another prayer at night, and there could be different prayers. Oh, go, Father, let this cup pass. Nobody will ever know what went on when the disciples went away and went to sleep, and he cried unto his father. I tell you, it's a different prayer than this one that's on the same day. It's the same day. Glorify me in Gethsemane, give bath and Golgotha. Glorify me. Let your name be glorified. May I please him. And he did please him. When he came up out of the waters of baptism, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He wanted to please the father. No matter The will of God had to be done no matter what it cost. As long as his father was pleased and he obeyed the will of God. Is that what you want this morning? Is that your bent in being this morning? It doesn't matter what comes, what happens in life, what trials, what storms come, what sickness comes, what... Storms hit me in my family. It doesn't matter as long as God is glorified. Boy, that's some place to be. But lastly, and I want to close with this, and there's much I could say, but there's the power here in verse 2. Look at this. As thou hast given him, that's the Lord Jesus, thou hast given me power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life, that's the Father, to as many as thou hast given him. That's the Son. Now, we're not taking up this, <laughs> this, this this morning. Let me tell you, we're not taking up this this morning. But how does he give eternal life? For he doesn't give eternal life to all men. He gives eternal life to those who come. He that cometh to me, I will not cast out. 
I am the door by me if any man enter in. There's an open door this morning. You can enter in this morning. Would you have a decision to make? Would you have a choice to make? Whether you step in and step over or not, or whether you don't, look at verse 12 of the same chapter. It says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them, there's the disciple, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou givest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. You know, he not only saves, but he keeps. Eternal security. Oh, don't be afraid of that. Oh, how I'd love to go on to that. What does he mean here when he says, what does it mean here when he says in verse 2, I was given him power over all flesh? Well, I have great commentaries, and most of them say he's talking about flesh, there's body, soul, and spirit, and that's right. He's talking about all the flesh of men, black men, white men, yellow men, and you're allowed to say that or not, but I'll say it anyway. Drunkards, harlots, liars, pedophiles, murderers, the rich, the poor, the black, the white, the unlearned, the illiterate, the king on the throne, the pauper in the poor house, all flesh of every man and every woman that is ever born. He has power over it all. Hallelujah. That word power is authority and dominion. Now, it's obvious that the Lord Jesus Christ, as I've already said, wants to glorify the Father. Eight times he uses the word glory or glorify in this prayer. And what way is he doing that for us this morning? Apart from the way that he's doing it in the cross and in Gethsemane, apart from what he's showing to us in his suffering this morning, what other way is he doing that for us this morning? How is he showing that he has power over all flesh? Well, he shows it when he saves he shows it when he snatches a drunkard from the grave of darkness and sin. He shows it, my friend, when he comes and lifts the pedophile and the sodomite and the sinners and the drunkards, wherever they may be, in the far-flung corners of the world, in Asia, in Europe, in Africa, wherever they may be, wherever there's a sinner calls, he has power, that power over all flesh. He's the power over to save that man, keep that man, bless that man and woman. There's nothing too hard for God, is there? You think there is? A lot of God's people must think there is. Do you believe God that he's able to save? Do you believe God that he's able to raise up that wee girl, Talitha? Or Willie Webb? What quality of life those two people have? I knew William before he was struck down. He has power, you know. Oh, but then why doesn't God do something when you don't just dictate to God? You never rule out the fact that we have a sovereign, eternal God who can heal and lift and change at any minute. But he has the power over all flesh. See, all flesh is not the same. Paul tells us, in 1 Corinthians 15, there's the flesh of birds, the flesh of beasts, and the flesh of fish, and the flesh of men. So you not get any flesh anywhere else. So he's not only the power over the flesh of men and women across the world and the nations of the world, young or old or black or poor or richer, not only, but he has over the fish. Of course, we know that when he said, cast the net out onto the other side. And they had to get another boat to take them in. This is it God I'm serving? Oh, he has, he has the power over the fish. He said to Peter, go down there. He had the power over, 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 over taxation, the taxation money. There was no money to pay the tax. He said, Peter, go down and put a hook in and there'll come a thing up with the silver coin in his mouth. That'll be enough for you and for me. And all this fish in Galilee. 
he called one of them up. You know, when he called them up, but when he came up, he had it in his mouth. Is your God too small this morning? He, had the power, he, he glorified God over the power of the fish and taxation. He glorified God over the beasts and temptation. Mark says when he was on the Mount of Temptation being tried and tested by the devil, he was surrounded by wild beasts. I wouldn't have lasted two minutes. They'd have pulled me apart. They couldn't touch him. Couldn't touch him. Boy, I'm glad I'm not serving an ordinary man. Couldn't touch him. He had the power over beasts. He had the power over fish. He had the power over birds. Boy, you know well, don't you, from the ravens that fed Elijah? What about the power over birds in provision? Listen to what he said in the Sermon on the Mount. They board the fowls of the air, the sow not, neither do they reap, nor they gather into barns, but your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much more better than the birds? Oh, there's a recession coming. I listen, and there could well be a famine coming. This will test you now. I hear people selling the second car already in their land. Provision? My God shall supply all our need. We shall never starve. Do you know that we built this house in 2007? 2007, you look, it was the worst recession for 30 years. And this place was going up. You, you check it. My God shall supply all your need. Listen, he has power over the fowls and provision, and he has power over the fowls and protection. Two sparrows. Two sparrows. The least and the meanest of all the wee birds. Two sparrows sold for a father, not, father, not one of them will fall to the ground without your father knowing it. Why should we fear? The raven he feedeth, the hymn says. And why should we fear? There's nothing to fear, Mother, this morning. Just lap it over into the eternal hands of the sovereign God. And he'll go before us and he'll provide and he'll protect for he is all power. Do you know we're only starting into this chapter? All power. Dunamis, the mighty power, all power is given to him. And there may be electing a new conservative leader, but let me tell you, they'll not elect anybody that's out of the will of God. He'll control it, and he'll do it for a purpose. If we don't look at life in the Scriptures, if we don't look at life like this in every day that we live, and every day as we go out in, and go out and enjoy yourself on the twelfth, and enjoy yourself in the days that lie ahead, enjoy the bonds, and enjoy whatever you want, enjoy yourself, because let me tell you, we're in for a winter. We're in for a winter. As time goes on now, we're heading down towards the gates ahead. Never things moved as fast as they're moving. God spoke a word into my heart one, and I'm not saying I'm going to preach on it soon, but I will preach on it. The horse, the hoofs of the horsemen of the apocalypse, the four horsemen of the apocalypse are riding in. Keep your ear to the ground. Do you hear the stampede? Assassinations in Japan. 
government overthrown in Sri Lanka, confusion in Britain, the worst you've ever seen amongst educated men eat in all their sin and all the wisest one of the downing house is the cat. At least she licked her face, cleaned her face. My friend, let us give thanks to God. Let us praise God the Father that he is a heavenly loving Father and whatever your experiences of your Father has been, listen, here's one here. He will never do you wrong. He'll provide and he'll keep and he'll bless and he'll lead and he'll guide according to his will. You just fall in behind and say, even so be Lord Jesus. He turned his eyes towards heaven and I don't know, I could never understand the burden that was on him that night. And he had just sang a hymn. Oh, God help us, he sung a hymn. And he knew all things. And he, he, he knew that they'd pull the hair so of his cheek. They'd already done that. He, he knew what was going to happen. He knew that they were going to strip him before the crowd and smash him and mock him. He knew it. He had said that there was prophesied. He knew it had to take part, take place. Yet he sang a hymn. Some of us have a sniffle of a cold. Someone said to me the other day, he says, I think I've covered of a sniffle of a cold. I said, had you a sniffle of a cold when you were a child? I had I. A wee sniffle of a cold. <laughs> and I can't, I can't get out to the meat. Come on now. Come on now. <clears throat> Dig in your heels and stand straight up and look up and say, Father, Father, in heaven, not in Westminster, in heaven. Let us pray. Father, thank you for touching my voice. Thank you, Lord, for the word of God that has gone out. Thank you, Lord, for those who will listen to it, not to me, but to thee. We're not concerned about that, Lord. We're not concerned about what they think. We're concerned about your word. Hallelujah. Strengthen us, Lord, in power today. Let those who leave here now, Lord, realize our God, our Father, that God has spoken into the heart. Let them rejoice on the way home. Let us praise the Lord all day. Let us commit ourselves into his hand. Let us pray for those who are worse off than ourselves. And let us give thanks and glory to God for all power is his in heaven and on earth.